Yes, he is. He is. He is. The true and living God, he is. Oh, Jesus, you are our everything. You are our absolutely everything. All that we need is found in you, God. So we acknowledge your great presence and your strength in the house right now. There's something that you're doing. There's something you're going to do that manifests your reality and your person and your strength and your power, your love, your grace in a new way. Unfold yourself here before our eyes. And we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, God is good. And he is here. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. Father, we don't take it for granted at all that you visit us, that you, that you come to the place where we are when we beckon for your name and your goodness. Thank you. We trust you fully. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you all. I hope you all doing well tonight. Um, yeah. I, I just, um, I, I'm, I'm just personally grateful um, to God that, that he does mighty things among us. Um, I never take for granted, I never have to be honest, never take for granted one moment that God does show himself strong. Never take for granted one moment that the saints gather together here. Never take it for granted one moment that people out there in their homes sign on with an expectation of God doing something. Expectation makes a difference, y'all. Expectation creates space and a vacuum. The Bible says faith is the substance of things hoped for. Um, faith can only give reality to something that you hope for, that you have an expectation for. Without hope, faith has, doesn't have a job. It's just it's the power to make something happen, but with nothing to happen. And so when you come with expectation, it's, it's like the, the man at, the, the, at Acts 3 that was at, that, at the, um, the temple doors for years, years, laid down there, 38 years, or was that the man by the pool? Anyway, it was a long time. And uh, Peter and John, he, he came by and he was expecting that people, he, was, he, was, he couldn't work, so he was expecting people to give him something. Peter and John walked by and um, Jesus hit him right quick and they said, um, Look at us. And the Bible says he looked up expecting to receive something from them. It wasn't what he was. He, he didn't get what he was expecting. He got so much more. Yes, yes. But it's the fact that he was in the presence of God. Everybody else who walked in that temple didn't have the connection with God to work that miracle in their lives. But he fooled around and looked into God's eyes expecting something. All you got to do is come on. <laughs> when you get on your knees at home, when you get in your car, and wherever you are, just have desire for God to do something. Expect something. Um, I remember the song, I'm looking for a miracle. Just that's, that's people. That, when people came to Jesus with that in their hearts, they got something. The Bible says that day that Jairus' daughter and the woman with the issue of blood got healed, there were literally thousands of people swamping them. And only two people got something from him. Why? Because they were expecting something. People were touching him, and it wasn't making a difference. The disciples said, why are you asking who's touching you? Everybody's touching you. But nobody got a miracle except for the ones that touched him with expectation. Expect something from God. He'll give you something you didn't ask for. Like I already said, a man at the, at the, at the, at the, at the temple that day, he, he, looked, he was looking for arms and he got legs. <laughs> that, now, you know, <laughs> now he can get up and do something for himself. God, Jesus wanted to elevate his life. <laughs> oh, thank you, Jesus. So we're um, continuing in the Renewed Mind, um, session three. The subtitle is The Called. Um, everybody in here has a call, and, and the degree to which you recognize that, it, it, 
it, it, it helps God to prepare you for it. Now, it's not an uncommon question for people to wonder what I'm called to do. Um, and it's, uh, but what makes it evident is, is what you're gifted to do. And not, necess- not gifted in church to do. That might be where your call shows up. But there's a call for the overwhelming majority of people outside those doors. We all have a call and a commission. Some of us are called to intercede. Some of us are called to worship leaders. Some of us are called to preach. Inside the, inside the kingdom of God, there's something for everybody to do. But I'm talking about what is God putting in your hand? He asked Moses, what is that in thine hand? Moses has been carrying that thing around for 40 years now. A rod, and he's using it to guide sheep and, 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 and ward off wolves. And uh, uh, he it had a hook on the end so he can grab a sheep by the neck and pull him back if he was in real danger. It had something else on the other hand that he could get with uh, 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 predators. He carried that thing for 40 years. And when God called him at that burning bush and Moses was doubting himself, God, he, God, Moses said, why would they believe me? And God said, what's that in your hand? He said, it's a rod. God said, th- throw it to me right quick. And he tossed that thing on the ground. And there was power in it that Moses didn't realize once God got a hold of it. So whatever God's called you to do, you've been doing it. (laughs) It's been in your hand. It's been in your life. It's what you think about. It's what makes you happy when you're doing it. It must make you bothered when somebody else ain't doing it. Why can't they just see? (laughs) It's the thing that makes you mad, to be honest. I get on my nerves all the time. That's, that's right there what you called to do is to solve that problem that's bothering you. And so the called have to see themselves as that because we are the called of God. Give me Matthew 11. Um, let's read 2 through 6 first of all. We're going to kind of move through this text tonight just step by step and, and, and address, see some things here. Um, remember this, this, this series, we're still in the renewing of the mind. So there's things here. That, that, that God wants to change about the way we see things or, or develop or evolve into another uh, type of thinking. Please give me that back. And it says there, now when John heard in prison what the Christ was doing, he sent a message through his disciples. John had disciples. He sent them to Jesus and asked him, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied to them, go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor are told the good news. You know what good news to poor people is? You don't have to be poor anymore. That's the gospel to the poor. God wants all of us to prosper at the next level. There is, there is, there's restoration, there's, 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 there's uh, wealth locked up. There are miracles that God is trying to set us up for. Give me that back. And blessed is the one who isn't offended by me. So now, um, here John the Baptist, interestingly enough, is having question about um, Jesus' ministry, the, the I don't say the legitimacy of it, but is this him or some other guy? And in the King James, it says, go show John again. Show and again are actually the same words uh, in the Greek. And so really what he, he told them was, go tell John and tell him again if you have to. And tell him again if you have to. It's interesting how Jesus treated John in this situation. Because John had given his life to be the forerunner for Jesus and to get the path straight, get people's mind in the right kind of way. John said the kingdom uh, of God is near. The kingdom of God is near. The kingdom of God is near. And then Jesus came on the scene and the kingdom of God is here. So John was getting people ready to follow Jesus, pull them out of their norms. People left their homes and went out into the wilderness. Um, They started hearing a message, repent, think different for the kingdom of heaven is close. So they began to arrange their lives for Jesus and Jesus responds when John said, are you the one? Instead of saying yes, he said, go tell him what I'm doing again. Remind him of what's happening. Why did he respond that way? 
Because God doesn't coddle the called. He cares for the called. He provides for them. He takes care of them. He loves them. He has grace and mercy on them. God doesn't coddle the called. There's spaces in our lives, and it can seem like it's the most difficult time that we have. That it's like God is silent. <laughs> it's like just before that, God was just saying everything came to his mind. <laughs> Running your whole life <laughs> like he tends to want to do. But it seems like God is completely silent. But the issue is he's only silent about the things we want to hear. When we get in spaces like that, when things get difficult, you tend to know how you want it to work out. We have a narrative as to how I can get from here to here. God, I don't want this happening anymore. I want this happening now. And that's what we listen for. But since God ain't saying enough, that we can't hear. It. <laughs> so we have certain things we want God to say, and we can't hear what he's actually saying. If God is silent or seems silent, it may be because I've turned off the channel he's talking on. Hmm. There's a certain, if I can use this as a metaphor, frequency, a certain space that God is dealing with each of us in. And sometimes you can almost notice a pattern of when and how God speaks to you. When your life, I, I, I know my pattern. When my life is doing this, if I take time to do that, if I abstain here, if I set myself up here, then I'm hearing clear. But a lot of times, if you get off of your frequency, if you get off of the space where God meets you, then many times you won't hear what he's saying. Give me Colossians 3, 2 up there. Set your minds on things above and not on earthly things. Look at set here two ways. You could look at it as, as set, like stick it up there. You can also look at it as, as set, like you do a radio station. Find the place where God is. Find the place where he's talking and tune into that space. This literally means elevate your mind and your emotions. Set what affects you. King James says set your affection. Set what affects you at a higher space. Because a lot of times in the midst of trouble, <clears throat> we, we, we experience the full blow of the trouble and get caught in the vortex or the whirlwind of the trouble because we're where the trouble is. <laughs> but the Bible says set your mind and elevate it to a different place because up there God is talking clearer than he is down here. God keeps talking. So if I don't hear him, I've got to move. I am the called. You are the called. And God, you know the first thing about the call? You know what we tend to do? When somebody says, God called me. When God calls us, we tend to go. But I was raised by Eugene Parker. And when he called me, that meant come. That didn't mean stay in the basement and say, huh? He said, when I, boy, when I call you, you come. That's what God wants us to do every time we hear his voice. Don't go. Come. And that happens over and over and over again in your journey. When you feel like the, 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 the well has run dry, it's time to stop going <laughs> and come to the one that can tell you where to go. Sit at his feet and let him refresh you. So there's a conflict here. Let's look at the conflict. Give me five, uh, one and, uh, did I mean? Yeah, St. John 1, 32 uh, through 34. And John testified, this is the same John the Baptist. I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove and rested on him. This was Jesus when he came up from the water after John baptized. 
I didn't know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water told me, the one you see the Spirit descending and resting on, he is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and testified, this is the Son of God. This is the same John in prison saying, go ask him, is this really him? God, God showed John in great detail who Jesus was. So there was no question. He, he was the witness. He was the first person on earth to know who Jesus was. And so he was the witness. But he began, began to waver. Listen, he began to waver over the very thing that should have given confidence. John knew what Isaiah 35 said. He would heal the sick. He would, uh, the deaf would hear. The blind would see. The, all those things that were mentioned here, when Jesus said, go back and tell him, John was aware of Isaiah 35 with that. So the very thing that should have given him confidence that Jesus and that God was present actually caused him to waver or set him up for the waver. Why could this be true? How is this possible? Because John was going through something at the time. John the Baptist was a man that was full of the Holy Ghost, the forerunner for Jesus. Jesus went on to say he's the greatest man ever born of a woman. But he was going through something. John was in prison. Not only in prison, but in prison for obeying God. He got in trouble while pleasing God. Has anybody ever had that as an experience? Like, really? <laughs> Now's the time you're going to pick on me. <laughs> and by you, I mean the devil and anybody cooperating with him. But this man was in trouble. God didn't tell John that he was going to go to prison. And something like that, when you're going through turmoil, especially as a result of living as the called, it can take the wind out of you. And it can skew your perspective even about God. It can skew your perspective as about what, what God is saying and doing right now. John was going through and he was in imminent danger. His life was about to be taken. Now, I don't know if he knew that for sure, but he knew who he was fooling with. And I'm sure the, the scuttlebutt, the, 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 the rumors in prison down there where he was, is that that girl asked for your head. He's not in a good space, y'all. And sometimes as the call, we end up in not a good space. Life can happen. Church can happen. Uh, money can not happen. <laughs> Kids can happen. Trouble and what it does if, 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 if we let it. And listen, listen, listen. We're all going to let it at some point or another. <laughs> I, I just, I don't want that to be true. I don't want it to be true that I'm going to go through something and have to recalibrate my relationship with God to get here. But, but it just, it, it happens in the journey. And so this man was in a lot of trouble and the kind of trouble that some of us get into in our souls. And he didn't know it was coming. He was blindsided. So there's the conflict. But then there's a new perspective here. Jesus is still demanding faith from the called. Even in their turmoil. He said, go back and tell John again. He, he, he didn't say, John, okay, I will get to that. Our mind has to be renewed from the world's system. But the world system says, I work, I get paid. I do good, I get good. I do right, I get done right. That, that's our expectation. But you're called. And the, uh, I don't want this to be bleak. There's, there's, there's hope coming. <laughs> I promise. I, I always try to get Jesus off the cross before the end of the message. And, and by extension, y'all off the cross. Um, There is a space that we'll come to where we, we, we begin to, especially if, if God's been blessing. God's been, man, God's been good. Oh, God did that. Oh, God did that. And then you hit that patch that is inevitably in the road where you will be tested. 
And Jesus won't always tell you what you think you need to hear. What John thought he needed to hear right there was, is it you or another? Yea, my son, it is I. And the work that thou hast done up until this time has been stellar. And you obeyed God in the face of uh, Herod and all of them, the Pharisees and all. And you should be greatly rewarded, O man of God, for the riches of your obedience to our Heavenly Father. Instead, Jesus said, um, just go back and tell him what he's, I'm seeing again. Sometimes God ain't telling us what we want to hear. Because faith is demanded from the call. It takes faith to access the power you'll need to fulfill your call. So you've got to exercise it from where you are and let it pull you up out of where you are to get to the space where you belong. And you got there not by God just snatching you out of the jaws of the lion. You got there by trusting God to work it out and you work yourself out and you gain the strength that it takes to survive and thrive in the next environment. It's the chicken and the egg. It's, it's proverbial. If you bust the chick out the egg, it'll die in the next environment because it won't have the strength that it would develop by breaking itself out. If it breaks its own way out, it takes a long time. You feel sorry for that little chickadee. Oh, he wet and all gooey and stuff like that. And look all pitiful. <laughs> like, where is mama? Somewhere watching him uh, get ready for life. <laughs> he break his little terrible gaunt little stuff. You think he could ever do it. Finally break himself out of there and then he rickety and frickety. <laughs> but that process gave him the strength he needs to live on the next level. God is trying to give us the strength to live, on, to live on the next level. And we've got to set our minds to those moments and those patches in the journey. So John began to doubt, and Jesus reminded him of the sign. Am I doing what, what you said that God said that I would do? Believing will never be without opposition. He said, he said you're blessed if you don't stumble on on, 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 my, uh, on my account. When you're doing the work of the Lord, the enemy is constantly trying to trip you up. J just realize that he, the Bible says he's just out there, just prowling like a roaring lion. And if you're doing something, we don't want that to happen. And he gets a fair shot, y'all. He gets a chance to shoot at us. And sometimes he hits us. And sometimes it hurts. But don't ever let anybody, including you, come in between you and obeying God. Because God's trying to take something. But be encouraged. Here it comes. Y'all can feel better now. <laughs> give, me, um, uh, uh, 11, uh, give me 7 through 11 in that same, context, in that same uh, text. <clears throat> so this is after they came to, they came, dudes came to Jesus and said, um, John said, are you the one? Is there another one? And Jesus told him what he told him. Go back and tell him what you see. And tell him he's going to believe God like everybody else. And as these men were leaving, going back to John, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out to the wilderness to see? A reed swaying in the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothes? See those who wear soft clothes are in royal palaces. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, see, I'm sending my messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare your way before you. Truly, I tell you, among those born of a woman, no greater, uh, those born of women, no one greater than John the Baptist has appeared. God is saying things about you that he's not necessarily saying to you. Jesus knew these things about John when that man came to ask him questions. <clears throat> But he did nothing to coddle or comfort John. He gave, he gave him parental, strong, boy, get, get up, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and, and, and stay in the game. But as soon as John left, Jesus said, man, y'all don't know who y'all fooling with with John. He was prophesied thousands of years before he was ever born. You call him a prophet, he's more than a prophet. Ain't nobody ever born of a woman any greater than him. 
God is talking about you behind your back. <laughs> Trust me, when things are going difficult, when things are going tough, when it seems like nobody can really see who you are, know and appreciate them, God is talking to somebody about who you are. <laughs> And when this thing all come together, it ain't going to be you fighting by yourself anymore. God going to round you up a squad. <laughs> Somebody's praying for you. I, mean, I, I need you to believe this. I need to believe it myself. Somebody's praying for you. God's whispering something in somebody's ear. He's telling you, stay on your square. Keep believing. I'm not going to coddle you. Grow up. Get it together. But he's coming over here saying to somebody else, I need you to cover them. I need you to give them a call. I need you to send them a text. I need you to give them a gift. I need you to say something to encourage them. God will say one thing to you, and then he'll say something about you. That changes the game. Yeah. There's always opposition in shift. Give me 11 and 12. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women who do greater than, uh, give me 12. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been suffering violence, and the violent have been seizing it by force. So this was a major transition. Notice he said from the days of John the Baptist until now. That's not a really long time. <clears throat> but this is the transition of the kingdom. Up, up to this point, <clears throat> the kingdom has been an earthly kingdom. It was, it was, you know, it was Israel until they got just deeper and deeper and deeper in trouble. But that was the kingdom of God in their minds. But Jesus was bringing something different now. And the kingdom was not about to be something that was um, overt and physical. That's what they wanted. That's why we talked about it Sunday. They took him and tried to make him king because they thought he was going to get haired uh, off the throne and Israel was going to be in charge again. They wanted, um, they wanted national reconciliation. Jesus was dealing with spiritual reconciliation. And so in this, in this shift, which God often has our lives in, in this shift, in this transition, there was turbulence and the violent people there now, actually, the Pharisees and the chief priests and all these people who are fighting against this new movement. They couldn't stand John. They couldn't stand Jesus and anybody that followed them. And so they fought against it violently. They, you, look at Jesus' life. They, every time they would look at him from around the corner on some stupid stuff, y'all. They really look really stupid, to be honest. Like, if I, can I say that word? They really did. Check this out. It was a man that had the hand that was withered. <clears throat> And it was the Sabbath day. The man came to Jesus. And Jesus was like, he could, he could read their mind. Y'all a mess out here. Sitting back warning, am I going to heal this man? Would you get your animal, would you get your ox out the ditch on the Sabbath? And so Jesus decided not to touch him to further the accusation that he did something on the Sabbath. So Jesus said, stretch out your hand. The man went, they was like, aha! Aha! He healed somebody on the Sabbath. Pause and evaluate that statement. He healed somebody. Can we stop there? He worked a miracle. He did something nobody could do. But they ran right by that. Straight to the law and their agenda. He did this uh, stupendous, marvelous, miraculous thing that absolutely nobody else could do but God. But he did it on the Sabbath, though. Y'all stuck on stupid with that man right there. You, you're missing the whole point. <laughs> but the, here's the thing. Again, the world was in transition. It was going from one kingdom to another. So the devil was just pulling out all the stops. He was doing, he would try to trap up Jesus and try to trip him up. And they look at him and try, we're going to get him with this. And they, they ask him another question. He said, well, answer this question. I'll answer your question. Oh, can't do that either. They were violently attacking what God was trying to do. And that's what the enemy will do in your times of shift in your life. He's going to come for you in those moments because he doesn't want to see things turn out like God planned. Give me 16 through 19. We're almost done here. To what should I compare this generation? 
It's like the children sitting in the marketplace who call out to other children. We played the flute for you, but you didn't dance. We sang a lament, but you didn't mourn. For John came neither eating or drinking, and they say he has a demon. <laughs> and the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and then they say, look, he's a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. So this is, the, the, the name of this point is people. <laughs> Look at somebody and say, people. <laughs> Went back and say, are you people? <laughs> Maybe sometimes, I don't know. <laughs> it's like, what else can God do to help you? So, so here, here's what this... Let me un unfold this a little bit. What Jesus is saying is that God has given you every chance to believe. He's given you every opportunity. He sent John the Baptist, who was a devout man, who kept the law, who, who, who went into living in a poverty life, out there eating bugs and honey, dressed in animal skin, looking wild. He didn't bother to shave because he was so committed to the things of God. And y'all said... He too saved. We ain't listening to him. <laughs> then I came along and was getting all close and, and loving on people and, and treating them right and treating them like they were somebody. And y'all said, look, he, he, he a drunkard and he hang out with anybody. He do. So John was too saved and I'm half saved. <laughs> what else can God do for you? <laughs> Sometimes it feel like you just can't get it right. <laughs> Listen, you can't please people. You have to love people and please God. You have to love people and please God. He goes on to say wisdom is vindicated through what it produces. If you love people and please God, the fruit that you bear is gonna vindicate the journey that you embarked on. If you do it God's way, you love people and please God, after a while, after a while, <laughs> it's gonna be clear why you made the choices that you did. The fruit cannot be denied. So stay the course, and it's going to become clear that God knew exactly what he was doing, and you did exactly what he said. 28, wrapping this up. Come to me, Jesus said at the end of this long discourse. Because he, 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 he knows that this condition that he's talking about is difficult. And that we're going to face it. So he left these words in the earth. He said, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Yes. Come is, is, is a cardinal number. What it means is come completely. Bring your whole self. Bring everything to me and to me alone. And I will give you rest. I will refresh you. I'm your only Source of rest, not rest from responsibility, but rest in responsibility. You can do the same thing from a different space. Yeah. He's the only one that, that, that knows what you're called to do. And sometimes we struggle with something. Have you ever struggled with something and found that the, that the struggle was in how you saw it? I am, um, when I received, about five moments, when I received the call, um, to, to, to full-time ministry. I always, it was in my heart um, that I would be in full-time ministry. I was just, I was, at the time, I was engorging myself in the Word. I was a musician um, as well in churches. And to be honest, at that time, I got to love in the Word so much that I abandoned music. And I was like, well, I'm, I didn't, I'm, I'm, God's called me to something higher than that now. And I just, I was just silly. It took a friend of mine to come to me and say, do you really believe that God would spend that much time getting you prepared for that, and then just you just drop it like a, you know, a rag doll or something. And he got sense back in my mind, and thank God he did, because the door opened, pertained to my music more than it did in my preaching ministry. But I was serving faithfully at a ministry that I absolutely loved. 
and I was serving there and, you know, working out here in Hope. <clears throat> and um, I got a call to come preach in another city. I went to preach at that church, and when I preached there, something happened inside of me that had never happened before. I became somebody else. The demand that those people put on me showed me a different me, and it felt like home. It felt like this is what I'm supposed to be doing. As it turns out, that ministry um, actually needed a minister of music, music that I had abandoned. <laughs> I had just quit. I ain't playing no more or singing or writing or nothing. And so when I preached there that day, I came back home to land. And I was just in this tumultuous place because in my heart, <laughs> I know what that felt like. But I was so committed and in love with where I was, the people and the work and everything. And I thought my full time ministry would happen right there in that space. And so for three days, this storm built up me in the confusion. It was by the by the Wednesday. It was almost like a panic attack. I think I've told this before. I was sitting on my desk. I had a metal desk just like this. Only I was pounding on it. Guys, and here's what I'm saying to myself. There's no way that God would ever tell me to do that. There's no way God would tell me to leave here. There's no way God would do. He loved me. I love these people too much. They love me too much. What would they do without me? I'm just probably, there's no way God would say that in, this, in the midst of all of this turmoil happening inside of me. I heard myself say this. Is there any way God would tell me to do this? Everything changed. All the fear left, all the confusion left, all the trouble left, all of my doubts and questions left. Because I gave God a chance to give me a different perspective. Instead of saying, God won't do this. God wouldn't do this like this. I said, would God? That's all he needed. <laughs> He changed my view, and it changed my life. And I stand in front of you today because of that moment right there. God sees what we see. He just doesn't see it how we see it. Give him a chance to have another conversation with you. He said, take my yoke, 29. So what the yoke does is it attaches you to Jesus, to where you're real close, and you learn to move when he moves, and you learn to move like he moves. There's times in your life when Jesus will bring you real close to you. Come on back, come on back, come on back home. <clears throat> come, just, just settle down for a minute. I need to talk to you. In those spaces, always, always, always obey him. He said, take my yoke upon you. And learn from me. That's what they would do with, with, with oxen, especially young oxen. They even do it with, um, with horses. They'll take a, a mature uh, thoroughbred and they'll attach, you know, a, uh, a colt to them because they, they're buying and acting all crazy. But they can't do nothing with the neck of that, 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 that grown, full grown. And after a while, they get tired of snatching. And they just run, wherever they run, they just run along. <laughs> they, just, they just do whatever the big boy does. You got all that other junk burnt out of them for trying to resist. <clears throat> There's times when Jesus wants to do that with us. He said, learn from me because I am meek and lowly. I am gentle and hard. Learn from me because I'm humble. That's not a description of how Jesus is going to treat you while you're yoked to him. That's the reason he wants you to yoke to him. He said, come learn from me because I'm humble. Learn humility from me. Because it's humility that allowed him to be highly exalted and have a name that's above every name. Come learn this from me. Let me show you how I want to respond. Let me show you how I want to think. Let me show you how I want you to treat this situation. Let me show you who I want you to forgive. Let me show you who I want you to give a second chance. Come stick with me for a while and gain some humility and now we're ready to go somewhere. He said, this is who I am. I'm humble, and I want you to get that from me because I know the fruit and the reward of that. He said, my yoke is easy. Why is your yoke easy all of a sudden? 
Why, why, why would Jesus uh, stress the point that his yoke is easy? Well, that's because things will be a lot easier if you're walking with Jesus because he's pushing too. <laughs> I could bust loose from his yoke and try to push my way through life and circumstances and things all I want to. But if I yoke up with him, it's not just my strength. <laughs> Jesus is taking every step I take, only his steps got a whole lot more consequence to him, a whole lot more power. And I will plow straight through something that I struggled to even get into. And he'll push me through that rough patch and get on the other side. And not only did I get on the other side, but I can look behind me and see where something was sown in the patch that we laid. And God can get things done in that place. Of obedience. So, Lord Jesus, we come to you. You said come to you all those that are burdened and with loads on us that are, and that you would give us rest. In, 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 in the most difficult spaces in our lives, Father, right now, we, we commit. We come to you now. Please show us the way to you. Remind us. We've been there before. We've been in the space before where it seemed like you were standing right behind our ear, whispering or speaking through every sign we saw. We, that, that space belongs to us with you. So guide us there and bring us into your yoke. We are the called. We are the called. And we want to express you to the full. We want to do your works and show people who you are through us in Jesus' name. Thank you. Amen. So, um, does anybody in the room need to accept Christ? Looks like everybody here tonight is family. Amen. So, Father, speak over this, the lives of these people here. Breathe upon us afresh. Breathe upon us anew. Have a clear conversation with us, God. Um, sometimes your, your voice can get lost in the other noise happening around us. But God, we refuse, we refuse to settle for that. That's, that's not our lot. We have a God that is near. You are in us. And so help us clear out the space. We want to bear fruit and more fruit and much fruit. Bind us together in unity. Bind our hearts together in this journey, God. Help us to be the strength for one another. We trust you, God. We trust you. We trust you. We trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, God bless you all. It's um, time to receive the tithes and the offering. So go ahead and prepare your gift to God and give him your best. Always bring him your best. Always, always, always bring him your best. <clears throat> Tabernacle of David, there's many ways that you can give. Um, a few weeks ago, Pastor Paul uh, mentioned that we're, we're going to start a, a, we're trying to move things toward um, Cash App because of the, the secure gift. Um, challenges, but if you don't, if you don't have Cash App yet and they ain't figured it out, go back to Skier again. <laughs> don't, don't stop giving. <laughs> write a check, write a do, do whatever you have to do. We ain't, we ain't criticizing nobody. For, look, for writing checks. So whatever you do, give. <laughs> Bring your best and get it to the kingdom uh, the best way you can. Everybody, stand to your feet. Father, we thank you for every um, ear and heart that sat in your presence tonight. We pray in the name of Jesus, God, that your, your, your word finds place and root inside of us all. Also bless, Father, those that are bringing um, their best to you to give tonight. And let it abound to us, Father, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Let men give into our bosom. Let us have opportunity after opportunity after chance after door open in Jesus' name. Amen. Seed go. I said together. Seed go. Seed grow. And harvest. I'll see you real soon. All my needs are met. I am out of debt and I have plenty left in storage. You may give and you're dismissed.